Sigi. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Oak House Church. It is time for us to go into the School of the Spirit. Now, the School of the Spirit is where we delve deep into the Word of God and dig to find those mysteries that have been recorded to be hidden in God's Word. So grab your pen, grab your notepad, and your Bible, and listen as we go into the School of the Spirit. And amen. Okay, so this morning, um, I want to... share with us again on um, the topic, the subject that I started the, the last two days ago, that is um, the journey, the journey of uh, a perfect man. So what we're going to be looking at today is how to achieve a perfect heart, how to how we may achieve a perfect heart. As we read in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter number 16, verse 9, in Second Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 9, and he says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. He said to this other man, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. I'm also going to continue with this in, um, in our service. I just want to um, eliminate this aspect. <clears throat> from the message that will be coming later, that is the aspect of how to achieve a perfect heart. And like I have always said, anytime we talk about perfection, a lot of people believe that it is not achievable, it is not a possibility, but if you are saying that it is not achievable or that it is not possible, what you are saying is that God is a liar, that God is not true or truthful to himself because he said here that he is looking for those whose hearts are perfect before him or towards him. And he said to Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. And again, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus again reiterated the same by saying, be thou perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And again, the one and the only goal in the ministry of Paul, what he stand out to achieve, he spelled it out in the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 27, where he says, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then it is on the basis of this, he says in verse 28, that in verse 28, he says, for this reason, he said, he preach whom we preach, that is Jesus Christ. He said, he is warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect before God. 
So you see, perfection or maturity is possible. It is achievable. It is commanded. It is a commandment. It's not just that God is uh, appealing to you. It is an instruction. It is a commandment. Okay? And now, many a times again, we misunderstand the meaning of the word perfect, being perfect. Being perfect means Isaiah 26 verse 3 tells us um, the meaning of one's heart being perfect. He says, he said, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind he stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. So, so here he's telling us that a man with a perfect heart is a man whose mind stays on God, whose, man, whose mind is stayed on God. A perfect heart is a heart or a mind or a soul that is totally and completely dedicated to God. That is, your heart is given to God. It does not matter. It doesn't mean that there is nothing wrong in your life. It does not mean that there is nothing wrong in that person's life. But what it means is that you have made up your mind. It is God and nothing else. Let God have his way in my life and do what he wants to do. Let God's will be done. I am committed to the word of God. I'm committed to, the, to doing the will of God. I'm committed to the obedience to God's will or to the God's word. That is what it means to have a perfect heart. And we see it again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, He says, if you then be risen with Christ, he says, seek those things which are above where Christ seated, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. So let your mind and your heart be set on things that are from above. That is to say, in verse 2, Set your affection, your love, on things above, not on things on the earth. You see, that is what it means. Somebody is, somebody's mind, somebody's mind and heart and soul and body and everything is all about God, about heaven. The things that I say, set your mind on things that are from above and not the things that are from my. So when you set your heart on things that are setting your heart, you know what, you have, what it means to set? When you set something, that thing focuses on a particular thing. So when you set your mind, you can set your mind on things on the earth, you can set it on things on, in heaven. So those of them who have set their mind on things in heaven are those of them that have a perfect heart. In what it means is in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it means to be spiritually minded. So you are mindful of the spiritual. For they that, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. This is what it means to have a perfect heart. A heart that is set on God. There is nothing else he's thinking about. There's the thing that 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 consume his thoughts, his words, his actions are 
the things that are spiritual. And when we mean things that are spiritual, we're not talking about those who are seeing visions and hearing, uh, seeing angels. And, uh, and um, uh, you know those funny stuff. That is not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that someone whose heart is dedicated to God. That is what it means to be spiritually minded. And so, another word is found in the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 13, verse 22. That is, I'm just trying to show you the different meanings of uh, a perfect heart. Is that okay? So, in Acts of Apostles, chapter 13, verse 22, he says that, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who we shall fulfill all my will. You see, a man after God's heart is the one that is set to do God's will. He is just interested in finding and knowing what the will of God is. He doesn't bother. The only thing that bothers him is To do the will of God. The only thing that bothers him, the only thing that gives him the greatest headache and concern in this life is to do the will of God and nothing more, nothing else. When you find a man like that, you have found a man with a perfect heart. And finally, another word for a perfect heart is a man who lives in obedience to the will of God, who had made up his mind to obey God's word. Come what may, come rain, come shine. Whether it is convenient or whether it is not convenient, he set his desire is to obey God. His desire is to please God. That's why Hebrew eleven six says, "For without faith, it is impossible to please God." So, a man who is living his life on the basis of God's word is a man with a perfect heart. It does not mean that that person has arrived in terms of your life or moral standard and all of that. No, you are still a project in the making in the hands of God. So you are, God is working. So what it means is that you are made yourself available to God and allow God to use you, allow God to do what he wants to do. It is no longer your will, it is his will. These are the kind of people that God is looking for all over the earth. Till today, God is still searching. You know why he's still searching? I will show you. Second Chronicle 25, in verse 2. It is possible for you to be an upright man. It is possible for you to be a righteous man and your heart is not perfect before God. It is possible for you to be a righteous person, doing right things. And he did what was right in the sight of God, of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You can be a Christian. You can be born again. You can be holy. You can be doing all those things, but your heart is not perfect towards God. So you can see the reason why God is looking for those whose heart is perfect towards him. You can pray, you can pray from now until Jesus comes in tongues, but your heart is not perfect towards God. You can win all the souls, your heart is not perfect towards God. You can see, he said he did what was right in the sight of God, but he didn't do it with a perfect, he doesn't have a perfect, he did not have a perfect heart towards God. So, how come? How can somebody do what is right, but he doesn't have a perfect heart? Because the one that has a perfect heart 
is the one that God says he will come and make himself strong on the behalf of that person. That is somebody doing something on your behalf. Not that you are asking the person. He goes ahead and does things for you. Verse 14. Verse 14. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Verse 15. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet. We said unto him, why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thy hand? You see what this man did. He went after God, collected the gods of the people where he went to fight and all of that, and brought them back and then established them and began to worship them. The same person that did something right in the eyes of God. He doesn't have a perfect heart. Now, everybody here in this room, listen to me very carefully. You see, you have a choice to decide what you want to make out of life with God. Many of you sitting down, both of you at the back, and those of you here, and those of you, those who are, and many people, they don't just want any change at all. They remain the way they are fixed and set in their ways. You are fixed and you are set in your ways. Anything they like, let them talk. When they finish talking, I am what I am. You are set on your ways. You don't have a perfect heart. Stubbornness, you don't have a perfect heart towards God. How do you know a person that has a perfect heart? When, when you rebuke that person, when you reprove that person, when you correct that person, he will thank you. He will be happy. He will love you more. When you correct somebody, when you reprove somebody, the person will take offense, be angry, or he tries to defend what he has done, or explain to you why he did what he did. He doesn't have a perfect heart. That's not the kind of person that God is looking for. God is looking for somebody, because if somebody has a perfect heart, it means you are desirous of God, you are desirous of becoming everything that God wants you to be under. You want to get there. So anything that somebody tells you something that is wrong in your life, that is making you, is going to hinder you from God, you will be so glad that somebody is opening up these things to you, and then you are going to learn from it, and then avoid it in order not to be a hindrance in your life, and all of that, so that you can get to the end. So that's why the book of Proverbs says, correct a wise man, and he will love you. Correct a foolish man, and he will hate you, and he will abuse you. If he doesn't abuse you physically, he will abuse you. I mean, if he doesn't abuse you openly, he will abuse you in his heart or in her heart. So that is why when we don't have a perfect heart towards God, I don't want to um, talk about... But one thing that God said about a perfect heart, he says... Those of them who have a perfect heart, I'm searching for them. When I find them, I will make my, myself strong. I will express myself on their behalf. You know when somebody is working for you, 
When somebody is doing something for you, you are not the one doing it. He does it for you. That is the reason why, see, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, is a prayer for those who do not have a perfect heart. Be careful for nothing but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and all of that and that and that and that. And there is nothing wrong with it. At the time I pray that kind of prayer, I pray those prayers. They are biblical, they are biblical. There is nothing wrong about it. But it's just that that is where you are at that stage. There is another prayer. Now compare Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and Psalm 23, verse 4. I mean, Psalm 23, verse 1 to 4. He said, The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack. He makes me lie down on green pasture. I'm not the one struggling to lie down. He makes me lie down on green pasture. He leads me stand beside still water. I'm not praying for him. Lord, please lead me. Lord, please direct me. Lord, please do this. Lord, please do that. Lord, please. God is the one walking on your behalf. God is the one doing all this. He is the one that set table before you in the presence of your enemies. But a person that is praying Philippians 4, 6 and the, and the rest of them is asking God for breakthrough, for help, for intervention and all of that. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 65 too, it says, Why, before, they pray, before they pray, God will do, will do what? Will answer. You have not said anything. You have, he said before you pray. He didn't say why you are praying. He said before you pray, which means God answers prayers of a man whose heart is set before him at a thought level. You just think about, just thinking about it, God does it. And if you be honest with yourself, you know that at a point, certain point in your life, it was happening to you. Especially in those early days when you got born again. When your heart and everything is set up. Just thinking about something. He make it me. Isaiah 65. I think he's in verse 8. Okay. Yeah, 24. He said, And it shall come to pass that before they call, they have not called. So before they call, he has already answered. And why they are yet speaking? What you are speaking, he has known, he heard what you want to say, and he has answered you. They are not the type that set out one day or three days or seven days fasting and praying and seeking God um, uh, for a breakthrough, for, for the fruit of the womb, for, for this one to happen or for the other one to happen. The reason why we do that is because is because our heart is not yet set on God. When your heart is set on God, he takes care of yourself. He makes himself so strong in your life. That is why he said he is the one that is at work in you, both to will and to do. This is a fact, but it works in the life of those whose heart is set on God. If your life is committed to God, absolutely, not 99.9%. And when we talk about your heart being set on, we are not talking about you getting everything perfect and right and all of that, no. Somebody has said, over my death, I would rather die than to do X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter. I would rather die. I'm ready to lose my life for the sake of this. I'm not going to shift ground. I'm not going to. And it is not a respecter of any person. It doesn't look at, it doesn't look this way when he doesn't favor him or he look the other way. No. Whether it has to do with you, or whether it has to do with your wife, or whether it has to do with your, your husband, or whether it has to do with your child, and all of that, it doesn't matter. What is right is what is right. That is what the person is. So anytime, even when you want to take any decision at all, with anybody, concerning anybody, any human being in life, what, the very first thing is that in your heart, 
your heart is already asking, what is God's will? Will God be happy with this and all of that? That is a man with a perfect heart. A man who does not rely on his own wisdom, on his own understanding. That is a man with a perfect heart. So anyway, I like I said, how do we achieve a perfect heart? And I also want to tell you that another word for that perfect heart is found in Titus chapter 2 verse 12. In Titus chapter 2 verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. So living a godly life is also having a perfect heart towards God. Because living a godly life is living a life of the Spirit, is living a life that is led by the Spirit. Another word is living a life that is led by the Spirit. But a, a godly man is a man who is, who is God-wise, who is thinking and talking about God, who is everything is about God. He lives for God. He doesn't live for himself. He doesn't want to live for himself. So even when you make mistakes, you see people who you see people who have a perfect heart towards God. When they make mistakes, when they sin, they mourn. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, somebody, when you break God's commandment, you don't just walk away. You don't just you will prick you, you will be uncomfortable. But when you don't have a perfect heart, you can abuse somebody you are normal. You can insult somebody you are normal. You can lie and cheat, you are normal. But you are born again. You see, that is why you can be upright. You can be an upright man. You can be doing things that are right, but you don't have a perfect heart. Because you are doing this, there are certain areas of your life you don't just want. Nobody is a no-go area. You don't have a perfect heart. I've been able to have had uh, some kind of experience with some of us here. Sometimes when you see the kind of things we say or do, it's it shows you the state of this heart is terrible. But they are born again. And they work for God. And they serve God. And they do all that. The way you open your mouth and talk to them. The way you address people. The way you react to people. And it's not that you do it, you know, it's something that you did mistakenly and all of that. No, you do it. It's a normal thing. You do it, you finish it, you walk away. You don't have a perfect heart. If they correct you, you will fight back. You give it to them back. You don't have a perfect heart. You cannot say, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil because he's, you can't say that. You can be, you can be confessing it all. For, till Jesus Christ comes, you will never experience it. Because that's why so many confessions, no reality. That's why we do a whole lot of confession, no reality. He said before you pray, before you ask, he has already answered. A man after God's heart. Give me Second Chronicles 16.9. Give it to me in, verse, in um, NIV or NLT.
For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully what? Committed to him. Is your heart fully committed to God? There will be evidence. There are proofs to know, to show that your heart is com fully committed. Not that you can be committed, but you are not fully committed. You can be committed, but you are not fully committed. The one that God is looking for are those that are fully committed. Full. Not partly. These are the ones that have a perfect heart towards God. And this is what God, when you hear Paul say, I'm preaching and teaching and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, commanding everyone to present every man perfect. That is what he, so that you will tune your heart to God. And God, that's what it means by faith towards God, not faith towards any other thing. So, a godly man is a man that has a perfect heart. A godly man is a man that sets his mind on the things that are from above. A godly man is a man that is mindful of spiritual things, he is spiritually minded. Let me also show you one of the very reasons to prove someone that has a perfect heart. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3. He says, you will keep him in what? Not, not, not half peace. You say he will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind he stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. You know what is peace? Anyway, we will deal with some of this when we do the in the main service. Let me just read out what you must do in order to get to having a perfect heart. Number one, you find it in Second Peter chapter one verse five. Anyway, Second Peter chapter one verse five. Number one, he say, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your what? Faith. So the first thing is that you must lay hold on faith. What is faith here? Faith is not the faith to move mountains. That's not the faith he's talking about. He's talking about faith towards God. He's talking about you trusting in God. He's talking about you staying for God, believing in God, believe in God, believe in God, believe in God. Faith towards God, not faith towards any other person, not faith towards any other thing. That is the first step. If you're ever going to have be a godly person, or if you're ever going to have a perfect heart towards God, then you must know your God. You must have faith in God. Yeah, you hear Paul say, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. He's, he's, he's leading you towards a perfect heart. He's leading you towards godliness. So now, the second, he said to your faith, add virtue. Virtue is moral excellence, more good morals. You are not a filthy person. You don't, have, you don't have bitterness and anger and malice and resentment and all of that living inside of you. You don't have unclean thoughts inside of your heart. You don't, you don't welcome them. You are not comfortable with them. So as they buffet you, you reject them. You, you don't just want it. Even when you fall, he said the righteous for some time and he rises. He doesn't want to stay there. He, he, so anytime you've done something bad and all that, he mourns. He cries. 
He feels so bad and so whatever guilty about it on your own. Not that any you, be, you don't want it. You feel so bad that you have offended God. You have broken God's commandment and all of that. You mourn towards it. So you don't retain any unclean thought in your heart. That's morality. There are people who are loose. They are loose with their mouth. They are loose with their body. They are loose with everything and all of that. You do something bad, you keep hiding it. You don't even want anybody to see and all of that. You keep uh, and not seeing it. You don't have a perfect heart. You're going to suffer. That is why people suffer. Being born again and all. We are the one holding ourselves, not God. So moral virtue. So add to your faith virtue. That is morality. Be a good moral, be of a good moral person. Don't approve things that are not clean. Don't even accept things that are not don't. So when you see a man with a perfect heart and all, he resents those things. You don't like them. They don't come near you. Number three, the third one is that add to your to your virtue, add what? Knowledge. Knowledge of who? Knowledge of God. Desire to know God. So somebody might say, so how do I know God? How may I know who God is? You know, like I was saying, you know somebody. How? How do you know somebody? Either because, either by what you have heard about the person or what you read about the person or as a result of your interaction or fellowship with the person. That's how you know someone. So growing in the knowledge of God is important because the more you know God, the more you are committed to him, the more you want to commit your life. Because when you know somebody, when you come in contact with somebody for the first time, you don't open up yourself to the person. You are just watching the person from a distance and all of that. Then after some time, after a period of time, you get closer. You guys get become closer and closer and closer. The more you relate and interact, the closer you become. It's fellowship. And through the interaction, you begin to bond. That's why everything, relationship grows. Your relationship with God grows. It doesn't happen automatically overnight. So that's why you add to your virtue what? Knowledge. And then to knowledge you add what? Temperance. What is temperance? You control your appetites. Control, being able to control your appetite, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. You don't everywhere you go, anything you see, you want to buy. Because people have, because you saw this person, you want to buy. Because somebody is wearing this, you want to get the same thing. And because, uh, you know, you don't control your appetite. You can drink and drink and drink. You can eat and eat and eat. You can watch the home video forever and all of all those excesses. That is temporary. You have to exercise certain control over everything that you eat or drink or you wear, or you see, whatever it is, you have to have control over it. If you don't, you become carnal. Everything is good, but not everything is expedient. All things are good, are lawful, but not everything that are expedient. It's only those of them that are expedient that is. So you have to be able to control your desires, sexual desires. The loss of the eyes, you control. The loss of the flesh, the pride of life, and all of that, you control them under control. That is temperance. Another one is said to your temperance, add what? Patience. What is patience? Patience is willingness to, to, to tolerate people who are difficult and people who are 
stubborn, a willingness to be able to tolerate people who are not pleasant to you without losing your temper, without flying off the wheel. The ability to be able to under, on, exercise control over situations so that you don't, you don't just um, uh, uh, misbehave. You don't compromise. You have patience. So, to your patience, when you lay hold on patience, what, then, what is the next thing? The next thing is godliness. That is a heart that is perfect before God. What it means is that you are living a life of godliness. It means that your heart is set on things that are from above. Where God lives. So, finally, I want to ask you a question. Of course, one of the manifestations, the evidence to show that somebody is living a godly life is that he loves. is brotherly kindness, loving one another. It's not, uh, you know, you know, some of you, you know, there are people you, they, some of you are no go area. Some of you are no go area, you don't talk to them. I want to ask you a question. What will it? What does it profit a man? Why, why do people like, why do we, brethren, Christians, love to, or like to, or choose to suffer? Well, a lot of us are suffering because you brought it upon you, because that is what you want to do. That's how you want to live your life. Why? All that God is asking you is that tune your heart towards God. Leave those or anything as long as your heart is not towards God. There are so many things you do, you get away with it. You do it without recourse to what God wants or what God... You, you, you say, eh, I want to travel abroad. You want to travel or whatever. You don't care whether God is there or whether God is not there. Or I want to buy this. You want to do this business. You want to do that business. You don't care. The bad James put it this way. He said, you that say tomorrow I shall go to such and so place and buy such and so thing and make such and so gain and all of that. And you do not know whether God wants you to do it or not. You see, a man after after God's heart is a man who is willing to do the will of God, to do the biddings of God. So because you don't care, you just want to run your life the way you want to. God, you live here. You are not a perfect, you don't have a perfect heart. You continue to struggle. Everything you have to fight for it. Everything you have to fast and pray. You know, when I said, you guys, and prayer, and prayer, and prayer, then some of you will wake up and say, Pastor, say it is not about prayer, so stop praying. But what I am saying is that you need to graduate from the prayer of give me, do this for me, do that for me, and begin to pray a prayer of I want to know God. I want to grow in the knowledge of God. I want to see your power and your glory. What does it take to see God's power and his glory? To carry, say, a right shine for your light is come and the glory of God is risen upon you and all of that. I want to live a life that produces fruits of righteousness. To make excellent decisions. To make decisions on things that are excellent and prove things that are excellent. This is the kind of prayer. To know your will. To be strengthened in my inner man with might, with all might, according to your glorious power. And all of that, there are so many, 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 many uncountable Pauline prayers all over. Look at the prayer of Moses. I want to see your glory. I want to know your ways. This is a prayer of a man after God's heart. 
Oh God, give me money. I'm believing you to give me money to buy a car. That's a man that doesn't have a perfect heart yet. You may be on the verge of going, getting there. Like I said, because you know, I know you're going to misquote me again. I know you're going to say, Pastor, say, Pastor, say, this one is that. What I said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 is that if you are praying, if you are still praying that kind of prayer, you mean that shows where you are. You are, on, you are still on a journey towards a perfect heart. You have not gotten there. When you have a perfect heart towards God, you don't need to pray for God to meet your needs. I told you many few years ago when I was asking God to give me money to get me accommodation and so that I can move out from where I was and stuff like that. And all. He guess what God told me? He said, go seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Your heart is set on God and his kingdom. He said he would give the and I obeyed and turned my whatever and started I focus my attention on the kingdom, on the church, on everything that God has given to us to do and all of that. It wasn't long. On, the, on his own, the thing came. I didn't pray for it again. I didn't ask for it again. But you can spend the rest of your life, you will fast, you will pray, you will bind, you will cast, then when you finish, you start all over again. There is nothing wrong about it, like I said. But what is wrong is that staying there for what? When you ought to have graduated, when you ought to be teachers, you are still there doing this thing. We must mature. We must grow. We must move from childhood stage to the youthful stage, then to the matured stage. We need to move. You need to be making spiritual journey. That's what it means to make spiritual journey. But when after five years of being born again, after ten years of being born again, your concern is again how God will bless you, how God will see you through, how he will give you breakthrough, promote you, do whatever and don't know. When you have set your heart on God and all of that, God takes care. That's why David, you know, David after a man after God's heart, that's why he could say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. He makes me lie down on green pasture. He leads me beside sea waters. He restores my soul for his name's sake. He has set able before me in the presence of my enemy. I am having anointed my head with oil. And my cup runs over. He's not the one asking God. He wasn't fasting and praying for it. He is just telling you what God is doing in his life. Amen. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word gives light. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' precious name.